In days when God's people longed for peace, Isaiah declared, Comfort, O comfort, my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that she has served her term, that her penalty is paid, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all of her sins. Isaiah 4, 41. We who gather today also seek comfort and peace, yet we are unsatisfied with ideas of peace that tell us to keep quiet and go with the flow. We long for real peace, true peace, just peace. We wait as people who yearn for peace that bears the fruit of community, equity, and flourishing for our all. We light these candles as signs of God's shocking hope and just peace. May they be beacons calling us to repent and to live the good news of Jesus Christ as we wait and watch and labor for the day when all people can gather together and worship and glorify God. Amen. Good morning again. Let's all stand together. We're going to sing from the celebration hymn number 245. we go to God in prayer this morning, I'd like for us to spend some time in silence, focusing on our prayers on peace, peace for our world, specifically peace in the Middle East today. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, during this Advent time, as we prepare our hearts and our homes for the celebration of your birth, our hearts can become anxious, our hands too busy to fold in prayer to you, our eyes jumping from one thing to the next and our minds following suit. Call us and center us into your presence as a reminder that peace has to start inside of each one of us, that we be settled and firm in your salvation, 
that we be confident and courageous in sharing your word, your life, your death, your resurrection, as well as your birth. Call to our minds those who are without today, those who are without food, without shelter, without friends or family, those without a church to call home and family. Let us be the ones that light a candle and invite them into your presence. In Jesus' name, as we pray the prayer that he taught all of his followers to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let's all stand and sing together one more time. We're going to sing from the celebration hymnal just back a few pages at 240. this time we worship God through our tithes and offerings. You may find offering plates here at the front to bring your gifts, or you may leave them as you leave the building. And I would remind you that always when we give into God's kingdom, we are giving into a kingdom that knows no end. Born of man. 
God, you are with us, for us, and work through us. We ask your blessing upon these gifts and on the givers that they might be multiplied so that all the world would know your love and grace. In Jesus' name, amen. This morning's scripture lesson continues with Luke, where we left off last week. Did anybody try to meditate? Did it, was it helpful? I admit I tried. I did it for a couple of few days, and it was very helpful. Uh, but despite its ability to help me focus on what was important to do and give me that sense of peace in mind, I think I'm like most people, and I get busy. <laughs> I go, oh, I'll have another coffee cup, cup of coffee, and we'll meditate later. Um, don't beat yourself up when you're trying to start a new practice. It's called a practice for a reason. We get to try again and again until it becomes a habit for us. So don't get discouraged as we talk about these simple practices to simplify not only Christmas but our lives. It takes time. So today we pick up with Luke chapter 1, verse 39 to 56, if you'd like to follow along. In those days, Mary set out and went with haste to a Judean town in the hill country where she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the child leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit and exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why has this happened to me that the mother of the Lord, my Lord, comes to me? For as soon as I heard the sound of your greeting, the child in my womb leaped for joy. And blessed is he, she, who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her by the Lord. And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has looked with favor on the lowliness of his servant. Surely from now on all generations will call me blessed, for the Mighty One has done great things for me, and holy is his name. His mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. And he has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy according to the promise he made to our ancestors to Abraham and to his descendants forever. And Mary remained with Elizabeth for about three months, then returned to her home. This is the word of God for the people of God. God. Last week, Elizabeth was our model for solitude. Today, she's modeling to give togetherness, simple togetherness. Now, how can she be both the model for solitude and togetherness? Well, I think she's Methodist. <laughs> I think Elizabeth was Methodist. We're always both and. It's solitude and togetherness that we need. We need time apart in solitude. And we need time of being together as well. It's both and, not either or. You see, God has made us for one another. It's through being together that we grow physically, mentally, and spiritually stronger, isn't it? Today, as we seek out ways to simplify Christmas and all of our lives, we're going to look to Mary and Elizabeth, these three months that they shared together. Imagine these women, one old, way too old to have a child, one a virgin having a child, getting to spend these three months together, living out 
the miracle of the sons that they are about to give birth to. They share their pregnancy with each other. Both the older and younger women can learn from each other. They support each other. They encourage each other. They console and comfort. And I imagine during that three months, there were times that they corrected each other. That's what we do when we're together in community. Their legacy for us today is their simple togetherness. It's in their practicing of what the Bible calls the one another's, like love one another, encourage one another, support one another, comfort one another. When we do that, it simplifies life and Christmas for all of us. You see, one of the attributes of simplicity that Adele Calhoun writes in her book on spiritual disciplines is that enjoying the simple pleasures that require no expense, that really don't cost us anything. Think about your most memorable Christmases. Do you remember the gift or do you remember the giver? As the Grinch says, maybe, just maybe, Christmas doesn't come from a store. Maybe Christmas is a little bit more. And for Mary and Elizabeth, they show us that that little bit more is enjoying each other's presence, about being community, about coming together, and specifically about being God's community and God's body, the church, with a capital C. We are simply better together than we are apart. <coughs> Can you imagine your life? Imagine your life. Look around at the people amongst you. Can you imagine what your life would be without the people in this room? Maybe it's the ghost, the impression of the people who have been in this room. The countless names that we could list that are now part of God's kingdom for eternity that made an impression that changed us, that made us different. Now, imagine that someone you know is very, very rich. They have a huge home. They have everything that life could offer. They travel anywhere in the world they want. But they have no friends. They have no family, no church, no community. There's a movie about just that. It's called Surviving Christmas. It's cute. Typical Christmas movie. Except that in it, the main character is a millionaire. And he has no family, no real friends to speak of. His parents, father left when he was a child. Mother is deceased from college. And now he has everything and anything that money can buy. And so he buys a family for Christmas. I'll let you watch the rest of the movie. But I'd also like you to keep your eyes open. Keep your eyes open this Christmas for people who have everything. People who you might be a little jealous of. And then go a few steps deeper. They might just be the loneliest people you've ever met. You see, the most valuable gift that you're ever going to receive is also the simplest. The present that God gives to us is God's presence and each other's presence. Ronald Rollheiser, who Adele Calhoun quotes in her book, says, We go to church so as not to be alone. Not to be alone in our joys, not to be alone in our suffering, or alone in the everydayness of our days in and out of everyday life. Alone in the important passages of life, like marriage, divorce, giving birth to children, watching parents go through hospice into the church triumphant. We're together. We go to church to tell people that we love them and hopefully to hear them tell us the same thing. It sounds like church in this place to me. 
She identifies in her book three Christian practices that are specific to building community. The first one is, and I have to do H's because that way you can remember it. And the only thing I could come up with an H for community was either hood or hamlet. But both of those are exactly what it means to be community. You know that people in gangs join gangs for the purpose of having community, of having what the church offers. Those three practices are having a hood or a hamlet, hospitality, and holy communion. She writes that the God-given fruit of practicing these spiritual practices is to grow in love and concern for other people and to be a part of something bigger than yourself. I would add that iron sharpens iron. I think God giggles when people come together because we come together expecting peace and, and, and we only hang out with people who are like us and God, God giggles because we actually grow more with people that we don't agree with, with people that don't think just like us, with people who are different. Iron sharpens iron, and God has given us the church in which to do that with. But we keep trying to make the church smaller and smaller until it's just like me or just like you, surrounded with people just like us us because that's comfortable we don't grow much being comfortable we grow when we're a little uncomfortable and we learn how to agree to disagree that first H is hospitality she defines it as the desire to be a safe person who offers other people grace shelter, and the presence of Jesus. Hospitality, you see, creates a safe, open space, whether they are friend or stranger, and they can enter in experiencing the welcoming spirit of Christ in one another. Shorter expression is, hospitality is when the Jesus in me recognizes, respects, and acknowledges the Jesus in you when we can look at another and recognize that they too are created in God's image. The Bible says, welcome one another, just for, therefore just as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. And you know, in John, when Jesus tells about those many mansions, he's demonstrating his hospitality. Because what does he say? He says, in my father's house there are many mansions. I go to prepare a place for you. A place for you. We prepare a place here with poinsettias in the windows, with banners, with a clean sanctuary, with welcoming smiles and open hearts, giving generously. We make this a safe place for ourselves and others to grow, to be more Christ-like. So how do we practice hospitality? Some of these might rub you. They did me. Sharing your home, food and resources, I'm good. Car, mm, getting a little nervous now. And all that you call your own. To share all that you call your own so that another person experiences the reality of God's loving, welcoming heart. Loving the guest is not the same as entertaining the guest. Ouch. I like entertaining. I'm excited about Christmas coming. In fact, I've got my menu, my appetizers planned, and what time people are arriving and the guests. In fact, but if they want to borrow my car or they decide that they're going to stay over more than a couple of days, your preacher's going to get a little nervous. The gift of hospitality means we offer that all the time. 
no matter how the house looks, no matter what food is in the refrigerator, no matter what's going on in our lives, the gift of hospitality says, you're welcome. You are welcome here. The next H is Hamlet or Hood, better known as community. I think Bonhoeffer, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, is probably the greatest source for understanding what it means to be the church and community. He wrote a little book before his death, Life Together. If you've never heard the name Dietrich Bonhoeffer, he was a priest in Germany under Adolf Hitler. In fact, he was accused, arrested, imprisoned, and later hung for being implicated in a plot to assassinate Adolf Hitler. He was only 39 years old, but wise beyond his ear, years. In that book, Life Together, he focuses on this gift, the simplicity of togetherness that's been given to those who are part of a Christian community. He says that we are Christ in community because of Jesus, through Jesus, and in Jesus. And I would add, for Jesus. Do you hear the same repetitive word? We're community not because we're the Kiwanis. We're community because of Christ. Because of Christ. Christian community means that through Christ and in Christ... No Christian community is any more or less than this. We belong to one another only and through Jesus. Jesus is the one that is our peace, as Paul writes in the letter to those at Ephesus. He says, without Christ there is discord, not only between us and God, but us and each other. The opposite is true, that through Christ, in Christ, because of Christ and for Christ, we can have peace in community with each other because of Jesus. Nothing else. Just as God has been merciful to us, we learn in community how to be merciful to each other. The Christian community is not this grandiose idea this and the word what's the perfect place that utopia thank you knew it was an e word it would come to me christian community is not about being utopia never was never has been ain't never going to be but it is created it's a reality that god has created to bring god's people together and in the midst of that is christ that's why we call ourselves christians we are a Christian community, named so because of Jesus. And guess what? I hope you looked really good and hard about those people around you and all the ones that are not gathered here but might be gathered somewhere else because we're going to spend eternity together, folks. We might as well start liking each other now. You might just smile and learn to love one another now because we're going to spend eternity together. <sighs> Therefore, make every effort to tear down any walls of hostility. Let Christ be the mediator as you make peace with your brothers and sisters in Christ. And as is said at a wedding, should also be said in every church. What God has joined together, let no one put asunder. And in Genesis, said it pretty plainly, it's not good for human beings to be alone. God didn't create us just for marriage and reproduction. God created us to be there for one another. Simple togetherness. So my other expert on community is one of my favorites, as you know, is John Wesley. In his sermon on Christian perfection, and Christian perfection does not mean, folks, that we get to do everything exactly correct. Uh, Christian perfection means that we love one another the way Christ loves us. That's our goal. 
He writes that being in community in church with one another minimizes six dangers of the Christian life, six watchouts, six pitfalls that we can find ourselves in. The first one he identifies is pride. He says, you see, one person ascribes knowledge, his knowledge to God and, and is therefore humble. But then he thinks of himself and thinks that he is more humble than everyone else. And then his humility becomes pride. Grace is not given to us for the purpose of an enlightenment, but so that we might be wise. Because we may be wise but have little love. Or we may have love with little wisdom. God has wisely joined all of us together as part of the body so that we cannot say to one another, I have no need of you. Even to imagine that those who are not saved cannot teach you is a very great and serious mistake. Being in community keeps us from pride. It also keeps us from enthusiasm, and that does not mean that we're not each other's cheerleaders. What Wesley meant by enthusiasm, it was a daughter to pride. And he, by enthusiasm, I mean the tendency to hastily ascribe everything to God, supposing that dreams and voices and visions to be a special revelation that God has given just to us. While they may be from God, they may also be from the devil. Therefore, believe not every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they be of God. Test all things by the written word of God, and let all bow down before God's scriptures. We should always remember that love is the highest gift of God. All of our revelations and gifts are little tiny things compared to love. There is nothing higher than in all of religion, than love. If you're looking for anything else, you're looking wide of the mark. Settle in your heart from the very moment, from this very moment on, that you will aim at nothing other than love, described as it is in 1 Corinthians, the 13th chapter. I'll let, that, let you look that one up. Wesley says that you can go no higher than this. The third thing is antinomianism. I love that word. You can just say it. It's like anti-disestablishmentarianism. Antinomianism is just one of those words you want to say. And it means against the law. What Wesley's point is, is that we can be so based on grace that we overlook God's law, God's command. Or we can be so focused on God's command and law that we overlook grace. And you have to, again, Methodists, both and. We hold these things in tension. God's law and God's grace, they go hand in hand. Being in community together keeps us from forgetting that. Because me, myself, and I, first of all, get along pretty good sometimes. And we also approve of each other pretty well, and we also think that we're pretty smart when we read the Bible. But how much more does all of that grow when you allow others to step into it and bring their insights, their grace, their love? The fourth danger is the sin of omission. Sin of omission simply means that you avoid doing any kind of good when there is opportunity. He says to be zealous of good works, do all the good you can, you possibly can, to the bodies and souls of your neighbors. Be active, give no place to laziness. Be always busy, losing no shred of time. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. Being together helps us to do that. How many of you individually could get up tomorrow morning and by noon feed 300 people? Anybody want to tempt it? Anybody think they can do it? With the people gathered in this room, 40 or 50 people, 
We fed 300 people in a couple hours. We're better together because our efforts are multiplied, because we all don't have the same gift. If you all required me to make the mashed potatoes, we would be in deep trouble. I do much better running back and forth to cars and running my mouth than I do up in the kitchen cooking. We need each other. The fifth danger is desiring anything but God. If your eye remains single, your whole body is full of life. In other words, by being together, it helps us to see and to claim that sometimes things like money, possessions, power, those things can start to consume us and take control of our lives. It's in being together in community that that helps to keep that in check by denying yourself and taking up your cross daily. The sixth thing, ironically, got left out of my notes. Um, I think that was one of those insights from the devil, not from, from God. And these are the words of John Wesley, who founded the Methodist movement long before Methodism was a church. Being together in community helps to avoid the danger of schism. Be aware of schism, of making a tear in the church of Christ, creating to have reciprocal, sorry, ceasing to have reciprocal love for one another is inner disunity, which is at the very root of all outward separation. Be aware of everything which leads to this separation. Be aware of a dividing spirit. Hmm. Maybe we've forgotten the importance of being together. Then there is Holy Communion. The fruit of Holy Communion together that we'll have this morning is having a passion for the unity of the church worldwide, appreciating the diversity of other believers who take the Lord's Supper with you. That's what Calhoun writes, what the Bible tells us of about Holy Communion is at the Lord's table that fateful evening before his crucifixion. There were 12 men with him. No two of those 12 men were alike. No two of those men thought alike or acted alike or even had the same relationship with Jesus. Of those 12, there was one who was clearly not on the same page with Jesus and the others. And his name was Judas. But it didn't keep Jesus from washing all 12 feet, all 12 pairs of feet, one at a time, personally washing their feet. They didn't all agree with one another. They didn't think alike. They didn't act alike or walk alike or talk alike. But what they had in common, what made them together, brought them together, was Jesus. There is nothing more or less that brings us together as Christian community. I hope that you will see that being the hood or the hamlet together that having hospitality towards others and that in sharing Holy Communion together, those things just don't cost a lot of money. They don't cost us a lot of time. They don't cost us a lot of anything. Just being together. As you think about Christmas, 
I don't think there's a person in this room that isn't going to have that same gnaw in your heart and gut that I'm going to. And that's not the gifts that are not under the tree. But the people who aren't there with us to share it with us. Simply being together is pure gift. Given to us by God. As we receive communion together, and I, somebody played a trick on me. They moved my hand sanitizer. I had it hid in the poinsettias. As we observe communion together, when I give you the bread today, I'm going to tell you something different. I usually say to you, this is the body of Christ given for you, right? Today I'm going to ask you to receive who you are. Because that's exactly who you are. You are the body of Christ in this world. And just as he gave his body for us, we are to give of ourselves to one another and to the world. I'll be sharing an abbreviated version of the liturgy this morning. Lift up your hearts and give thanks to God. Blessed are you, O God, who with your word and Holy Spirit created all things and called them good. In Jesus Christ, your word became flesh and dwelt among us. It is through Jesus' suffering and death that you took upon yourself our sin and death and destroyed their power over us forever. You raised from the dead this same Jesus who now reigns with you in glory and pours, poured upon us your Holy Spirit, making us the people of your new covenant. On the night before meeting with death, Jesus took bread and he gave thanks to you. He broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, Jesus took the cup and gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ offering for us Pour out your Holy Spirit on all of us gathered here and on these gifts that in the breaking of this bread and the drinking of this wine we may know the presence of the living Christ and be renewed as the body of Christ for the world, redeemed by Christ's blood until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at your table forevermore. Through Christ, with Christ, in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. This is the body of Christ that was broken and given for you. This is who you are, to be broken and given for the world to his glory. The cup of salvation for all people everywhere for all time. By receiving it, may we become a light to his love and grace. Gordon is going to direct you if our musicians would please come first. Receive who you are, the body of Christ.
together once again. We're going to sing simple gifts. Tis the gift to be simple. Tis the gift to be free. Tis the gift to come down where you ought to be. And when we find ourselves in the place just right, twill be in the valley of love. and the knowledge that you are a beloved child of God. And may you give God thanks for the beautiful family that he's brought you together to be a part of. May you go in simplicity and simple togetherness. Amen.